Okay, so let's just recall a couple of things. Recall. Uh, what did, where did we leave off? I, I, I want to re record Schwartz's lemma somewhere. So let's recall Schwartz's lemma. Fundamental result. Can someone tell me what Schwartz's lemma says? Should I pick on someone? It's a very fundamental result. So I wanna make sure we remember what it says. What's it about? St start me off. A function on a disk. Thank you, Birchin. So I have a holomorphic function from the disk to itself. And all I know about it is it's holomorphic. It's not injective, it's not, not conformal, nothing else. Not injective, not conformal. Well, not bijective, not onto, not onto. Oh, that's weird. Oh no, that's never happened before. Why is that happening? Onto, I have done something that this is the, the range of my ability to write. Um, how do I change that? I can go all the way from here, but I can't go here. Okay, I guess I have to do this. Hang on one second. I don't know why that happened, but let me do this. Is that as far as I can reach? That is as far as I can reach. Very bizarre. This has never happened before. Okay, let's try that. Okay, can you still see this? I don't know why this is happening, but uh, it is what it is. Okay, so recall Schwartz's lemma. F is holomorphic, not injective, not onto. I want, so F is a function from the disk to the disk. Um, I want one thing about it. What's the one thing that I want, the one property I wanted to satisfy? Yes, Sriram, you can say it. F of zero is zero. Good, F of zero is zero. So the image of zero is zero. F of zero is zero. Then I know two things. What do I know about the absolute value of F of Z relative to the absolute value of Z? I, I, I gave it away. Uh, and equals, if there's ever an equal sign here, then F is rotation. And the other thing I know is that the derivative of F at zero is at most one, thank you, Birchin. And equality implies F is a rotation. Right? Okay, so that was Schwartz's lemma. We saw a whole bunch of uh, nice maps. We saw some consequences of this. We saw that the automorphism group of the disk is SU11 or PSU11. We saw that the automorphism group of the upper half plane was SL2R or PSL2R. We talked about all of this. Right, I wanted to mention one thing. Um, we were talking about all these uh, quadratic forms and Hermitian forms and sesquilinear forms and so on. Um, here's one little note, a side note, of why these are nice groups. Um, D is itself, is itself defined by quadratic forms or Hermitian form. So I claim if you look at the set of complex numbers, so that if you take Let's see, let's see if I can get this right. Negative one, one. In projective coordinates, I'll say Z one. And I'll multiply on the other side by the uh, transpose conjugate by the adjoint. Let's see if I can get this right. So what is this, what is this product? This product is uh, negative Z bar one, that's a bar, times Z one. So that's um, 
negative norm z squared plus one, and that being greater than zero is equivalent, if I move z to the other side, oh no, everything is wrong. I have a very restricted, uh, I can't go down either. So I have to fix the bottom. Um, apologies, experiencing technical difficulties. Let's try that. Okay. You can see that as well. Um, so I have to scroll. If and only if, uh, let me move the z squared to the other side, one is less than z squared, which of course, if and only if z is in the disk. Okay, so the disk itself is defined. So this is the disk. The disk is the set of points that satisfy a, a sesquilinear inner product or a bilinear inner product with respect to this, this form. What about the upper half plane? So let's see, you're in the upper half plane if the imaginary part of Z is positive. Uh, and that's true if and only if twice the imaginary part of Z is positive. And that's true if and only if, is it Z minus Z bar? Um, that's gonna be twice the imaginary part, twice two I times the imaginary part. So, um, so I wanna take negative I times this so that I kill off that I. So how do I get negative i z minus z bar? I think I do this, negative i z times z bar. I think that's right. Let's see if this works. Let me multiply these two. So I have z bar times zero and i. So here I get i, and here I get negative z, negative i z bar times z one. Is anyone checking this calculation? Am I doing this right? And uh, here I get I Z. So I want negative I Z. So let's change this to a minus sign and this to a plus sign. So this will be a minus I and this will be a plus I. So this inner product is negative I Z um, plus I Z bar, also known as, so this thing is supposed to be bigger than zero that's also known as negative i times z minus z bar. And this is two i times the imaginary part. So this is negative i times twice i y, y is the imaginary part of z. And negative i i is two y. And two y is positive if and only if you're in the upper half plane. Okay, so, so maybe it shouldn't be so surprising that stabilizers of quadratic forms will be the automorphism groups of the upper half plane and the disk. They are themselves given by quadratic uh, forms, Hermitian forms, right? This form is, is Hermitian. It's real on the diagonal and conjugate trans, conjugate, uh, it's conjugate transpose is itself, self adjoint. Okay. That was the last remark I wanted to make about that. Let us continue to the Riemann mapping theorem. So Riemann mapping theorem. Any questions so far? Let me state it in this way. Every pair U and V of uh, proper simply connected sets uh, what do I mean by proper you're proper if you're not empty and you're not everything okay anytime you have a pair of subsets of the complex plane where you're not empty you're not the entire complex plane 
and you're simply connected, then U and V are conformal. So the conformality, there's a, there's a single cluster of conformality types of proper simply connected sets. Okay, uh, proper connected and simply connected. Connected and simply connected. Um, I guess if they have the same number of connected components, all right, let's, let's not go crazy here. Let's stick to connected. Um, wh why is this true? This follows from every such U is conformal conformal to the disk. If everybody's conformal to the disk, the disk is proper, connected and simply connected, then, then you map whatever U is, you map to the disk, and then you inverse map it to, to V in general. All right, so we have to find a conformal mapping uh, from anything to the disk. This will involve a number of steps. Most of the steps are elementary. Uh, and then we need a little bit of functional analysis, not functional analysis, it's like uh, baby real analysis. There's, there's gonna be one step where we have to, where we have to do something. Um, okay, so let's begin. Suppose, so this is step one. Step one is to get inside the disk. Step one is get inside the disk itself. Get inside the disk get you to be inside the disk. Okay, so here's how we do this. So we're given totally arbitrary U and it's not empty and it's not the entire complex plane. So here's U, I have no idea what it is. It could go off to infinity. All I know is there exists some point, there exists alpha in C that's not in U. Well, so what? Then the function f of z equals z minus alpha is never zero in u. And u is simply connected. That implies there exists a function, let's call it g of z, which is log f of z. Remember how you do this. What you do is you pick some arbitrary point, let's call it W, um, and you integrate. So you take the integral from W to Z, wherever Z is, F prime over F, plus some constant to make, to make this, uh, what do I mean by it's a logarithm? So that E to the G of Z is F of Z. Remember, if we have a simply connected, so the fact that it's simply connected means it doesn't depend, uh, th this is independent of choice of path. U is simply connected. So uh, this is well defined. I didn't say which path to take from W to Z. And all we need is that the denominator never vanishes. F of Z never vanishes in U. So far, so good. All right, so, um, so let's see. So what happens to this thing? Well, it goes somewhere. Uh, let, me, let me apply G. So if I apply G, I guess the point W goes to whatever the constant C is. I mean, this is G of W, wherever that is. And then here's the image. Well, I don't know what to, I don't know what to draw. I claim, that there does not exist a Z in U such that G of Z is equal to G of this fixed point W plus two pi I. I claim that if you take this G of Z and you slide it up by two pi I, 
then it's not in the image. Why is that? If, if such exists, if such exists, then I can apply, I can exponentiate e to the g of z is equal to e to the g of w plus 2 pi i. But that's, of course, e to the g of w. And that's f of w. f of w is z minus alpha f of w, which is w minus alpha. And this is also f of z, which is z minus alpha, which implies z equals w. But if z equals w, then g of z is g of w and not g of w plus 2 pi i. Did everybody follow that, that little bit of magic? So what we've shown is that we have this arbitrary fixed point W inside U. U is not empty, so there is a point W. U is open. I mean, by a domain, I always mean open. Wherever G sends W, it can't send anything to G of W plus 2 pi i. This point is outside the image under G of U. So again, this point is not in G of all of U. I claim something even more. I claim that there is a disk of radius epsilon, so a neighborhood of G of W is completely disjoint from the image. So not only is this point not there, there's no, there's a ball around G of W, which is which avoids the image a ball around g of w plus 2 pi i that avoids the image of g of w. Why is that the case? Is everyone following so far? Why is that the case? So if not, if there's no such ball, then there exists a sequence zj uh, in, in u such that zj such that g of zj goes to g of w plus 2 pi i, right? So there would be some sequence of images, g of zj, that walks all the way to, OK, I can't get the point, but I can get close, arbitrary close to the point, right? If there's no disk, if there's no disk that avoids all of the image, that means there's a sequence that, that goes to the, to the point. Does everybody see that? Um, okay, but if that's the case, then e to the g of zj goes to e to the g of w plus 2 pi i. The function e is continuous. This, as before, is w minus alpha, and this, as before, is zj minus alpha, which means zj goes to w which means g of zj goes to g of w and not to g of w plus 2 pi i. Same argument. We've run the same argument twice. So now we've done something rather magical. We found a way of sending um, u. So we've mapped this u. By the way, uh, the point is, uh, this map G, so note uh, G from U to G of U is a conformal map. Why? Bridgen, go ahead. Uh, be because of these two claims, it is one to one. Yeah, it's one. To, well, yeah, exactly. It's one to one. Um, it's one to one. I mean, it has an inverse. 
it has an inverse because e to the g of z is, uh, I guess, e to the g of z plus alpha recovers z. So it has an inverse, so it's one to one, and of course, it's holomorphic. So holomorphic and invertible and has inverse. Okay, so, so far, what we've shown, let's, let's do this again. So we have this region U, we have some fixed point W, we mapped it under G to something so that G of W goes here, but I know that there's an entire region near G of W plus two pi I that is disjoint from the image. The image avoids this disk. Okay. So now what I'm going to do is translate, translate this point to the origin, translate g of w plus 2 pi i to 0. So I'm just applying z maps to uh, z minus g of w plus 2 pi i, which is obviously holomorphic and invertible. So here's now my disk which avoids the image of you. And uh, let's rescale things so that this, instead of being a ball of radius epsilon is a ball of radius one. So I send uh, rescale, rescale uh, so that this disk of radius epsilon about g of w. Well, now it's now it's not about g of w, it's about zero. Rescale so that the disk of radius epsilon about zero goes to the disk of radius one about zero. In other words, I send z to what? Uh, one over epsilon z? Okay, so that so now now this gets rescaled to an entire unit disk that's avoided by the image of of you. And now I invert. And now apply z goes to one over z. And in in this range, z is never zero. And so this is a nice map and it takes things of, and it's holomorphic. This is also uh, holomorphic, invertible, and it takes this image inside the unit disk. So this last map, Z goes to one over Z, takes things outside the unit disk, inside the unit disk. And what we have is some region we've brought you you at first was some arbitrary shape, whatever it is. I don't know anything about it. It's some arbitrary subset of the complex plane. And by this series of maps, first the logarithm map, then, okay, some stupid stuff, a translation, a rescaling and an inversion, we've contained you inside a disk. Okay. And uh, by translation, I can assume it contains the origin and assume uh, after translation, um, the new, I'm gonna call this, I'm gonna call this, uh, can I re just rename it to you? So we don't have, so rename this, rename to you. We had some U that we started with. We did a whole bunch of stuff to it. This is the new U, new and improved, 2.0. Uh, assume after translation that the origin is in U. Okay, so that is the end of step one. We've said any region whatsoever can be mapped to some region inside the disk conformally that contains the origin. That's the easy part. Step two. So let's look, so assume that U is a subset of the disk and contains the origin. Let's look at the family of functions 
This is a set of holomorphic functions. These are holomorphic, injective, and send uh, zero to zero. Do I need send zero to zero? Yes, holomorphic, injective, and send zero to zero. Okay, is this, that's all I want. I just wanted them to be holomorphic functions to the disk that are injective and send zero to zero. Um, is this family of functions empty? Can anyone think of a function that sends this u, so now I have some function f that sends this to somewhere else, but it, wherever it is, it's inside the disk. It preserves the fact that zero goes to zero and it's, it's injective. Not a bijection, just injection. Yeah, the, the identity map, exactly, great. So z goes to z is a nice function in this class. Okay, so it's not, it's not empty, it's not empty. Here's the magic, um, magic. So this needs to be, uh, we're going to, it's going to take quite a lot of work to, to verify this. I claim, so let, let's look at the derivatives. So this function has some derivative at zero. Um, zero is in U. Let's look at the supremum over all functions in this class. Okay, so let's call this S. Is this S bounded from below? Is it at least something? Yes, vice, vice zero. The identity belongs. The identity function has derivative one. Okay, so it's at least one. If it's the supremum over all functions, the identity function is there, the derivative is one, so it's at least one. Is it finite? So let's remember, so we're not at the magic yet. That, well, the magic is to, to think about this, is to think about a function that maximizes this, this derivative. Um, recall the Cauchy representation, integral representation, that f prime of z, including zero, is one over two pi i times an integral of a disk of radius some epsilon of f of z over z minus zero squared dz. And this epsilon is whatever disk around zero is contained inside u. So that this is inside of u, or its closure is inside u. But it's a fixed epsilon. It doesn't matter what the function is. OK? Um, so if we take absolute values, I'm just rederiving the Cauchy uh, inequality. f of z is always at most 1, because all of the f's take values this in absolute value is at most one because it maps to the disk. Uh, one over two pi i, so I get a factor of one over two pi. Um, one over z, z, the distance from z to zero on this, or the boundary of the disk, right? I want the, the circle. I'm integrating over the circle. You remember this Cauchy integral representation. So what is the absolute value of z minus zero? Yep. Exactly. Thank you, Britchin. 1 over epsilon squared. That's this. And what's the length? And all that's left is the length. And the length is? 2 pi epsilon. 2 pi epsilon. Perfect. In particular, this thing, whatever it is, is bounded by, it's bounded by 1 over epsilon, where epsilon is the, is some disk so that, the, I mean, u is open. So we have some, 0 is in u, so there's some disk around zero that's in u. And so, yes, indeed, 
uh, the supremum is bounded, so it's finite, and it's at least one. Okay, so now for the magic. Magic. Um, this is a claim that will take quite a lot of work to back up. Let me claim that there exists an F in F such that the derivative of F at zero is equal to this supremum over all the other. Let's say I, I can find, it's a supremum, so there's a limit. Does the limit exist? Is the limit holomorphic? Is the limit injective? All those things have to, we have, it's gonna take quite a bit of work to verify that. So step two is to find such a magical function. Let's assume we found such a magical function. Step three is to show, so assume claim, let's put this claim in, I owe you this. Step three, such an F is onto. And if it's onto, and if it's injective, then it's a bijection from U to D. Hence, U is conformal to D. Okay, we're gonna argue by contradiction. Uh, assume there's some alpha that's in the disk, but not in F of U. So again, here's, here's our disk. Here's U, I don't know what U is. It contains the origin. This is U. F, I don't know what F does. It keeps the origin where it was. It lands inside the disk, but whatever it does, it misses some point alpha. So now we're gonna play a couple of games. Um, and my claim, my claim is that then uh, F prime of zero is not maximal. I'll find another function which has a, a bigger derivative. Okay, so here's what I wanna do. First, I wanna apply, you remember these Blaschke factors? Blaschke factors. And now I do want to use the ones uh, in the book. They're a little bit more convenient in the sense that they send alpha to zero and they send zero to alpha. So they interchange zero and alpha and they're their own inverses. It's the minus of the one that we were dealing with last time. So far, so good. Um, okay, so let's apply psi alpha. What happens to this point alpha? And this is only a automorphism of the disk if alpha is in the disk, right? So I'm using the fact that alpha is in the disk uh, to, to, for this argument to work. So what happens to alpha? Let's get a little bit of color. Oh, I didn't go far enough. So this point, the origin, stays at the origin. But now what happens to alpha? What does psi alpha do to alpha? It sends it to zero. OK. Sends it to zero. Um, so this is psi alpha of alpha, also known as zero. And, and alpha is not in the, um, in the image. So the rest, whatever it does, is over here somewhere. So I've avoided alpha. So far, so good. Um, all of these regions, this region is simply connected, simply connected and connected. And it doesn't have the origin in it. I'm going to use the same trick a second time. The same trick. Let's see. 
this argument is going to take a little work. Um, maybe I should pause here since I promised you a break. Should we pause for, for five minutes? And and because because this is where it's going, I, I need you to concentrate. And if I'm at the edge of where your concentration uh, is, then we're going to go like 20 minutes. And uh, yeah, let's do this right. Let's take uh, five minutes now, if that's okay. And we'll, we'll come right back to where we were. Yeah, take five. Okay, so so just to recap what, what we've done so far, um, we started with an arbitrary function, arbitrary function, uh, arbitrary set u, all we know about it is that it does not hit every single point of C and it's simply connected. It doesn't hit every point of C, means we can put a log function and a log function has this wonderful property, it's, it's invertible and um, it's, will miss a neighborhood of some point plus two pi i by, by its very nature of being invertible. And so we can use that with a little bit of rescaling and translation to get everything inside the unit disk. So the question now turns to the unit disk and the key idea, the magic idea is to try to show that there does exist a function which maximizes the, uh, which is, is in injective, is holomorphic, does send zero to zero and maximizes the derivative at zero. So this is gonna be a little bit of uh, functional analysis type argument. Uh, step three, given that we have such a function, that's the, the big claim that I I'll take some time to justify. Let's see if we can show that F is onto. So if it's not onto, if we miss some point alpha, then we can apply this Blaschke factor psi alpha to move that point to the origin. Once that point is at the origin, then, then, so now we're, now I'm talking about this region, zero is not in the image of, let's see, I took F of U and then I took psi alpha of that. So zero is not here be precisely because alpha is not in F of U. That means I can define a logarithm. So there exists, what should I call this? Uh, H, let's say H of Z, which is log Z, which is the integral from uh, any point, but let's take, uh, where did the origin go? The origin went to alpha actually. The origin is now here. So this is um, F of zero, which is zero, and then psi alpha of that went to the origin. So let's go from that point. Let's take the integral from alpha to your favorite place Z. Uh, one over w dw plus some constant. So there exists a log on, on this set. And if there exists a log, so e to the h of z recovers z itself. So it's invertible. So it's holomorphic. If there exists a log, there also exists a square root. So I want e to the one half h of z. So this is what we think of as square root z. Okay, so you can, you can apply square root to all of this. Now, why would I want to apply square roots? How would you have the idea to apply square roots? What do square roots do? I mean, it doesn't, it's not so, there's nothing special about square roots. Um, What's special is that any power, if we have some power, so why this? Does why this? Make it bigger. Yes. Huh? Exactly. Exactly. Who said that? Was that? Oh uh, yeah. Exactly. If R is let's let's just look at the real numbers. What do I know about square root R versus R? Which one's bigger? If R is less than one. 
What's the square root function look like from zero to one? Square root of one is one, square root of zero is zero. It looks like this, which means it's above the y equals x line. So square roots increase things, but we shouldn't be able to increase things. We shouldn't be able to define any of this. We shouldn't be able to define a square root function if f is maximal. This, the idea is this increases things, increases things, which shouldn't be possible, which shouldn't be possible if f is maximal. And now we're going to make this, uh, this, this proper. We're going to turn this idea into a proof. OK. So let's apply H. So now we're going to apply H. I don't know what H does. Whatever H does, it uh, makes things a little bit bigger. I'll try to show that. Doesn't really matter. What has happened to, um, to this point? So this point is alpha, right? This point is now alpha. And now I have square root of alpha. I have no idea where square root of alpha is. I guess it increases the real part a little bit and it has its, uh, I'm gonna put it there. So this is H of alpha. So far so good. And now all I wanna do is put that H of alpha back at the origin. So which map will I apply to put this back in the origin? Yeah, Sriram. Blaschke factor. Blaschke factor. So I'll apply the Blaschke factor psi h of alpha. So that has put this dot back at the origin where it, where it belongs. Okay. So now we have a new we have a new we have this giant chain of functions. Okay. So let's call this whole chain of functions big F. Is there a way for you to see this? Yes. Okay, so big F, by definition, is you do little f, then you do psi alpha, then you do square root, this big H, square root, then you do psi H of alpha. It starts in U, it winds up, I don't know where, in the disk. It is holomorphic. Is it injective? Why, Ishan? Each one of the functions are injective. Each one of the functions is injective. Not only is it injective, it's invertible. Well, except for this, except for F. I don't know that F is invertible. All I know about F is it's injective. But these are all invertible. These three are invertible. Uh, so these three are injective in particular, and F was injective, so it's injective. And where, what is big F of zero? We started here at zero. We stayed at zero under F. We moved over to alpha under psi. We moved somewhere under H. And then we applied psi h alpha to put it back at the origin. So at the end of the day, we wind up at the origin. So what do we know about big F? It's an element of, uh, I have to go all the way up here to get to this function class. We have this space of functions from u to the disk that are holomorphic injective and send zero to zero. So big F is in F. Does everybody see that? Um, okay, now let's look at little f. Little f um, how do I get from big F back to little F? 
So if I take big F, I apply, um, this is its own inverse. So I apply psi H alpha. Um, then I can apply, what's the inverse of Z, of, a, of big H? How do I invert big H? Square it. Square it. Awesome, Kayla. So I'll apply the map Z goes to Z squared. So if I square a square root, I undo H. And then I apply the map um, Psi alpha. So I'm just saying, if you wanted to do F, you could do big F, undo Psi, undo H by squaring and undo Psi. And that would do the same thing as F itself, right? Those, those three other maps are invertible. So I undo Psi H alpha, I undo this by squaring, and I undo this by Psi alpha. So that's how little f is a function of big F. Okay. Let's call the combination of these three things, let's call that something, capital phi. Okay. So capital phi, capital phi of z is uh, psi h alpha composed with uh, z goes to z squared composed with phi alpha. Okay. Um, all right. What do we know about phi alpha? This thing, all of these functions are functions from the disk to itself. I mean, it didn't originally have that domain. It had the domain of uh, whatever this was, but actually there, all three of these functions are nice functions on the disk. It's holomorphic. And where does it send zero? Psi of zero. So this, so it's psi alpha of uh, the square of psi h alpha of zero. Does everybody see that? Psi h alpha of zero is h of alpha. H of alpha, exactly. Psi h alpha of zero is h of alpha. So this is h of alpha. So now what about this thing? h of alpha squared. What is h of alpha squared? Alpha. Alpha, because h of alpha is the square root of alpha. So this is alpha. And what is psi alpha of alpha? Zero. Okay. So this, so this bit, which we're calling psi, sends zero to zero. In fact, we saw it right here. It sends zero to zero. From here to here is what we're calling big phi. If only we knew something about functions that sent the disk to the disk were holomorphic and sent zero to zero. If only there was some lemma that told us something about such functions. What does it tell us? Which lemma? Just Schwartz's humor. lemma. Schwartz's lemma, thank you, Kayla. And what does Schwartz's lemma tell us about, for example, the derivative of this thing at zero? less than or equal to one. Beautiful. The derivative at zero is less than or equal to one. And could it be equal to one? If f of is a rotation. Yes. If it's equal to one, then psi is a rotation. Is psi a rotation? If it were a rotation, it would be a bijection. 
is psi a by, uh, I call it, I'm calling it psi, it's is phi. Is phi, sorry, is phi a rotation? Theorem says no. If it was a rotation, it would be a bijection. Rotations are bijections. In particular, they're injective. Is, is phi injective? Is there an issue with the squaring? Yes, yes, Kayla. What's the issue with squaring? Squaring isn't injective. Not injective, not injective. So it can't be, it can't be a rotation, which means, which means that the derivative of phi at zero is strictly less than one. And that's, our, that's a big problem for our little f here. Little f, let's compute the derivative of little f at zero. Um, it's just phi of, this is phi composed with big F. So little f uh, derivative, let's see, what's the chain rule? Phi prime of big F of zero times big F prime of zero, right? And big F of zero is just zero. Big F of zero is zero. So if I take absolute values, what I find is phi prime of zero is strictly less than one. That means little f prime of zero is strictly less than big F prime of zero. But big F, big F is in the class. But F prime has largest absolute value of derivative f, f has largest this in the family f, which, which is a contradiction. If you're missing one point, you can make logarithms. And if you can make logarithms, you can make square roots. And if you can make square roots, you can make squares. Squares are not injective. And that's, that's the whole, that's the proof of the Riemann mapping theorem modulo, modulo the fact that there does exist a function which maximizes this derivative. So let me pause there. Do you guys, do you see this argument? Pretty cool. Can you go over that like sketch you just said one more time? Yep, yep, let's do, let's, re, let's re, remember the steps. So again, we started with an arbitrary u. Whatever it was, we knew nothing about it. U, there was some point alpha that was not in u. Um, that meant we could make a log. We used a log to, um, to move this. So we had some fixed point w. We didn't care what it was. Wherever it went, we, we made a log because uh, because this alpha, we really made log of z minus alpha. We applied log of z minus alpha, which is uh, which you can define because alpha is not in u. Um, that moved w to some place here. So this was the function g. And then because it's log, it doesn't, it couldn't take the same, we, it, it forced a branch on us. And if it forced the branch, it can't take the same value at two different parts of the branch. Okay, so it never, so this point, this point, in fact, an entire neighborhood around this point is not in the image of u under this logarithm map. And that allowed us to translate u all the way into the disk. So that was step one, is that we could get u inside the disk. Okay, step two, was when we had u inside the disk and, um, and it fixed uh, the origin. So we looked at this family of functions, f is the set of functions from u to the disk that are holomorphic and injective and they fix the origin. And we supposed, this is the thing that I have yet to, uh, verify for you, suppose there exists a function in here such that um, 
f prime of zero is as big as possible, is the supremum over all g in f of g prime of zero. That maximize the derivative just at the origin in absolute value. Okay, if such a thing exists, claim this f is onto, and we're going to prove the contrapositive. If it misses, so if contrapositive, contrapositive, if uh, not onto, then there exists some other function in here with derivative at the origin strictly bigger than the derivative of f at the origin. And the way we do this is this series of transformations. So again, we have, we have f, which does something, fixes zero. If it misses a point, if it's not onto, it misses a point alpha, then we applied psi alpha to bring that point to the origin. That point at the origin, we could apply, because the origin isn't here, we can apply square root. And square root does whatever it does. You can, you can make a square root as long as you have some, some branch cut. Uh, and, then, um, and then we just moved this point. We wanted some, something that, uh, so where did zero go? Zero went to alpha, uh, sorry, zero stated zero. Then it went to alpha, in fact. So I kind of haven't drawn this very well because alpha was, was going to be there. So this is psi alpha of zero, namely alpha. And then that went to somewhere here. This is square root of alpha, a choice of branch cut of square root of alpha, again, using the fact that we have a logarithm because this point is, uh, so this is using logs. This is e to the 1 half log z. And finally, we move this point square root of alpha. So now we apply psi square root of alpha to move the point back into the origin. And so this map F has a strictly larger derivative than this map. The reason is this map from here to here backwards by applying the same psi alpha, then applying z squared, then applying the same psi alpha has a comp is a map which is a map on the entire disk. And by Schwartz's lemma, um, it is not um, it is not a rotation. The reason it's not a rotation is because it's not one to one, because the map z squared is not one to one, and hence its derivative is strictly smaller than one. And and then we just apply the chain rule to see this. Does that make sense, Kayla? So we use logarithms twice. We used uh, we used these psi alphas, and we use crucially use Schwartz's lemma and the non-injectivity of the map z squared, which undoes square rooting, if you can square root. OK, so far, so good. So the thing that I owe you, which I anticipated I wouldn't be able to do all of today, is this. So why does such an f exist? Why? Let's start a new page. Uh, so again, why does such an f exist? Why does such an f exist in f? Again, um, f is the set of functions from u to the disk, um, which are holomorphic, injective, and send 0 to 0. So if s. Again, if s is the supremum over all functions in this class of g prime of 0, then there exists a sequence of functions, f1, f2, and so on, all in f, but the set of these is all in f, with um, the derivatives at the origin going to this number s. And I want, I want that there exists a subsequence of the fj um, that is in with a limit 
with a limit in f in f. If that existed, then it would be it would have the limiting uh, supremal value. Okay. So so let's let's do some general theorems about um, about uh, classes of functions. So this is Montel's theorem. Montel's theorem it says the following. Let F be a family which is um, uniformly bounded on compacta. So this is a family collection. This is a family of holomorphic functions. Uh, let's say from, from somewhere to somewhere, doesn't matter where, um, which is uniformly bounded on compacta. We'll prove the more we don't need uniform boundedness on compacta. We're going to be bounded anyway because we're all the all of our maps are inside the disk. But I'll prove the more general theorem for you just so that you uh, get some practice with these techniques. Let u be a family of holomorphic functions which uh, is uniformly bounded, uniformly bounded on compacta. So what does that mean? I.e. Um, for every compact subset of U, there exists a bound B so that for every function in the class and for every point in the compact set, F of Z is bounded by B. In other words, so all of these functions, they take some region u, whatever u looks like, to some region v, which doesn't need to be bounded. But anytime you take a compact subset of u, then the image under any one of these f's, the, the f's are all different. The image under any one of these f's uh, lands in inside some uh, disk of, of radius v. OK, so that's uniformly bounded on compacta. Uniformly bounded would be it's true for you already. Maybe these are just functions. You don't know where maybe they're not going to some some region V. They're going just they're just holomorphic. They're going somewhere. They don't have to all go to the same place. They don't, they don't have the same images or anything. OK, so that's the setup. And of course, our family does have this uh, property then we can conclude two things. One is that the family will then be equicontinuous. Then, I already have then, then F is equicontinuous. So this is a uniform continuity. Maybe you've seen this already. Have you seen this already in real analysis? I know you cover our Zella Scully in real analysis. You, have, you haven't gotten there yet. Okay, is equicontinuous on compacta. What do I mean by that? I.e., again, for every compact subset of U, I want continuity that's uniform, uniformly continuous and uniform over every single function. So for all epsilon, there exists a delta. The delta can depend on epsilon and it can depend on the compact set, but not on anything else. So you see, what I'm trying to say is f of, let's see, I'm trying to say z minus w less than delta implies f of z minus f of w is less than epsilon. So each function is continuous. So for every function, if you give me an epsilon, I'll give you a delta at that location w. But if I don't care about the location w, that's uniformly continuous. And if I don't care about the f either, that's equicontinuous. So for all f in the family and for all points z and w restricted to this compact set, we have this continuity principle. Okay, so equicontinuity is just uniform continuity, not just on the space, but restricted to a compact set, uh, but over all functions. 
Okay, every single function will be continuous with this modulus, with this relationship epsilon to delta. Okay, that's like we cont continuity. And part two of Montel's theorem is uh, the, the family is normal. F is normal. Again, these terms, uh, these terms are uh, horrible, horribly overused and abused, but it's, you know, what it means to be a normal subgroup is not the same as what it means to be a normal family of, is it like perfect, there's all these god awful uh, words in mathematics. Um, F is normal means that for any sequence, for any sequence, for any sequence, F1, F2, and so on in F, there exists a subsequence um, converging uniformly on compacta. Converging not necessarily to something in F, not necessarily in F. Okay, it just, it just has a, for any sequence of functions, there's some subsequence that converges uniformly on compacta. And this, we've, we've talked about uniform convergence on compacta. Should I remind you what that means or you remember? Remind you what that means? No, yes, yes, remind you what that means. Converging uniformly on compacta. So if, um, so I have this subsequence F N J converges to F uniformly on compacta. Let's see, can I pick on someone to, um, let's see if we can unpack all the, the terms. You see convergence point-wise would be that F and J of W goes to F of W, right? Or minus F of W is less than epsilon, as long as this NJ is big enough for, or let's put it like this, NJ bigger than some N implies this, right? And uniform is that this would happen for all W uh, in some compact set. And so, so uniform on compacta is uh, for every compact subset of the domain, compact subset of the domain, um, and for every epsilon, there exists an N, which can depend on epsilon and the domain, but nothing else, so that for every W in the compact set, uniformly over W, as long as NJ is larger than N, you have this, this inequality. Okay, so um, let me just remark that, so let's see if we can see all of Montel in one, in one sitting. So again, this is a very, it's a, it's a big theorem. It's, it's as big a theorem as the Riemann mapping theorem itself, but it'll be crucially used in the proof of the Riemann mapping theorem because I have to uh, justify this one supposition that there is a function which achieves the maximal uh, derivative at the origin. So, Again, if we have a family of holomorphic functions, which is uniformly bounded on compacta, we don't need the on compacta part in our application, but it'll be uh, important to have the general statement. Then first of all, the sequence is equicontinuous on compacta. So it's uniformly continuous over all functions and all points, as long as the points are restricted to a compact set. And the family is normal, which means uh, any sequence has a subsequence which can Converges the, the, the limiting function doesn't have to be in the class F itself. It just converges to something, to some function, and it, and it does so uniformly on compacta. Okay, let me make um, two remarks and we're out of time. So remark one, remark one is that uh, one, one is truly a complex, uh, a complex holomorphic um, holomorphic uh, thing. Uh, here's the counterexample. 
the functions, here's my family, fn is sine of nx on zero to pi, say. So are these uniformly bounded on compacta? Well, they're just uniformly bounded because they're bounded by one, right? So these are uniformly bounded, check. But what do they look like? So here's zero to pi. So sine, sine looks like this, right? That's the first half. Sine of 2x, I guess, looks like that. And sine of 3x looks like that. And sine of 4x looks like this. And sine of 100x looks like this. Are these going to be equicontinuous? Will the modulus of continuity be independent of n? Not a chance, right? So no way, definitely not equicontinuous. So the equicontinuity will crucially use holomorphicity. Okay, so equicontinuity, so equicontinuity crucially uses holomorphic functions. But uh, there's a theorem in real analysis, the arzella scoli theorem. Just want to plant that, that name. I'm sure, so you haven't seen it yet in real analysis. I'm sure you'll see it. It's a fundamental uh, fact. It says that um, if something is uniformly bounded, if a sequence of functions is uniformly bounded and equicontinuous, then it's normal. Uh, this is, oh, this is a, uh, in, in metric spaces, but it's certainly true over R. Uh, is uniformly bounded and equicontinuous implies normal. Sequences have convergent subsequences and the convergence is uniform on compacted. Okay, so that's just a uh, remark. I guess this was remark one and maybe this is remark two. So we're out of time. We will do the proof of Montel's theorem uh, next time. So this is what I owe you. I owe you Montel's theorem. And then we will have completed the proof of the Riemann mapping theorem. So modulo Montel, I hope you see and agree that the Riemann mapping theorem is really extremely elegant. Montel is also elegant, but it's a different kind of elegant. So um, it's just this, I guess this is the Riemann mapping theorem in, in a slide. One slide in the Riemann mapping theorem. This is, this is where Montel comes in. I have to justify this. Otherwise, everything just uh, goes through with one use of Schwartz's lemma, a couple uses of logarithms. Okay, that can be it for today.